Welcome back. Um, my name is Karen Colney. I'm the director of the Verily Center for Art and Politics, and the center is the host of this two-day conference on um, modality and locality. Um, we just had a absolutely fantastic uh, panel, which was entitled Fugitivity and Endurance, and asked about the question of time or temporality of spectral infrastructures. And I just want to thank Adrian Heathfield, Nora Sternfeld, and Maria Halayova, who was the moderator for this really very inspiring discussion that looked at modes of modeling, um, anticipatory learning, but also free prefigurative politics. And um, at some point, um, we were reminded that we should attend to the latent emergencies. Um, I cannot help but mention briefly um, uh, one of the current Verily Center fellows, um, Rashida Phillips, who is a member of Black Quantum Futurism and who is currently developing a project of Verily Center Fellowship project entitled Time Zone Protocols, which explores the agreements, protocols and rules underlying westernized time constructs. Um, it will be presented at the new school as a um, conference um, and an exhibition and actually a restaging of the conference that happened in 1884, um, the International Region Conference in Washington that standardized protocols of time um, over 200 years or close to 200 years ago. Um, anyway, I, I think there's a link in the chat. But now let's turn to the last panel of To Hold Things Together entitled Sediments and Residues. The um, uh, concept of that panel is um, a call to look at gentrification processes as they sift the spatial unconscious of cities for, and find residues for urban creativity and radical social, social, sociability to stabilize the financial fantasies of um, an urban regeneration. Um, similarly, the reputational capital of education institutions is built on the rejected moments of radicality that sediment together to a frisson of excitement that cannot be traced back to any continuous presence. The components of such excess deposits may be found in the very fabrics of environments and institutions, or they may come to form a spectral infrastructure that haunts the spaces and will not let them calcify as the profit machines of human capital they are so desperate to become. And with that, just a note about the format, um, Irid Rogoff, um, who's Professor of Visual Culture at Goldsmiths, will open this panel and make a presentation. She'll be in conversation with Louis Moreno, who is a lecturer also at Goldsmith. The two of them will have this conversation and Maria Hayerova, the general and artistic director of Bach, will moderate discussion among them. The chat room is yours. Please paste comments and questions in it and we'll get to them as soon as we can. And now, sediments and residues, and thank you very much for joining us. Hi, thanks, Karen. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so Irides and I have um, slightly kind of changed what we were intending to do. So we were originally going to give two presentations, but I think what we're going to do is engage um, in a conversation um, about sediments and residues. And the reason why we've changed it up a little bit is because uh, there's, there's two things we want to do. One is to respond to um, uh, the question that Denise Ferrer de Silva asked um, at the end of the first segment, which is um, what are the analytical stakes, stakes of this idea of spectral infrastructure? So we wanna, wanna think through, um, is spectral infrastructure um, a contribution to critical theory? If it is, then what kind of criticism does it generate? Okay, and then the other dimension to it in conversation with um, what our friends um, Adrian and Nora just presented was if if they were talking about the the, the, the time of um, spectral infrastructure, then what Irita and I want to do is to think about um, well what what is the spatiality of spectral infrastructure, particularly 
if we are going to take seriously um, the claims of critical theorists over the last 30 years, who've talked about the manner in which um, the forces of finance capital are able to um, mobilize their conscious and unconscious command over nature, over social life, over psychic life, through its ability to secrete space, and that space becomes the medium of controlling time and intensifying time. So we want to think then about um, um, what does this term spectral infrastructure kind of do in relation to critical work? And then we also want to think about spatio-temporality and the dialectic of space and time in relation to some obviously fundamental urban questions today about, um, about the environment, whether that's the, the environment at the level of planet, whether it's the environment at the level of um, uh, the urban, the city, or whether it's the, um, the environment of sensuous interaction, the level of touch and of intimacy. Now, before um, we get into it, so I think what we're going to do is um, I'm going to set up a, a kind of a question and then Arit is going to take over. Before I do that, I'm just going to see if I can share my screen a second. And I just want to show an image um, that I hope may help kind of illustrate this. So um, this is an image, um, it's a real estate image, um, a computer generated image, which is a piece of collateral, a bit of real estate advertising, which was produced to um, signify the emergence of a new postcode, right? a new location for real estate in London, um, just before 2020, because I think it was opened in 2018, 2019. And it was described as a new part of London and a new urban experience. And it's called Coal Drops Yard. And it's part of the, the King's Cross Urban Regeneration Scheme in central London, which is one of the largest in London and is also one of the largest in, in Europe. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this image is, um, is to set up this question um, of infrastructure, first of all. Okay, so before we get to the spectral dimension of it, um, what I'm interested in in this image is not only the, um, the aesthetics of real estate, which um, try to capture and crystallize and um, as Nora was saying earlier, kind of petrify social relationships into a kind of form which can be manipulated and abused by finance capital. As well as that, which I think were to a certain extent, particularly if you live in New York and obviously if you live in London, you'd be very familiar with as, um, as a process of gentrification. What's interesting about um, this scheme right, this scheme, this plot in London, is that um, it's a kind of a spillover effect of um, an art school. So this um, project, Cold Drops Yard, which is meant to be this very upscale, bougie, convivial, um, um, new kind of urban shopping experience, right, with high-end brands and kind of concept-driven kind of shops, with um, music stores, record stores, and, and even places where you can buy a cup of coffee and that cup of coffee can set you back um, 20 quid. All of this has been made possible because of um, um, uh, the university, Central St. Martins, which neighbors it. So I'll just stop sharing my screen there. So you've seen this image, right? But this image is a kind of a spillover of a mode of inhabitation of the city, which has been made possible because of the way um, the art school has, has become mobilized as a, as a kind of an apparatus of, of capture. So before we get to the, the spectral infrastructure dimension, I thought what we could do, um, and what I could ask Irit to do, is to um, just 
take us through um, what's going on here in the way in which capital via, say, the radicality, you know, or the pseudo radicality, the kind of defanged radicality of um, higher education in the art sector. Um, how, is, how is that enabling um, capital to inhabit um, the city? I was just wondering what Irid's thoughts are on, on infrastructure in relation to these new modes of aesthetic inhabitation of the urban environment. Uh, thank you, Lewis. The, the, um, I think maybe I would want to, to um, sort of, of think a little bit about the, the ways in which, um, in which things are harnessed. Um, and I think that the, the, um, in this particular case, I think we, we're both thinking of spectral infrastructure in relation to habitation. So having understood the extent which, in which, to which we are infrastructural beings, uh, not ideological beings, but beings whose governance is constantly indexed in, in relation to resources, to funding, to spaces of enablement, spaces of inhabitation. So, to also start thinking about indexing as well to what we might call the environments in which we exist and how they might declare one thing and, and act its very opposite. So perhaps the, the sort of, of, Lewis, you're thinking about um, what, what is happening in the urban sphere. And for me, the, the kind of declarative voice of what higher education is, um, of, of how it wants to kind of present themselves, is a, an instances in which these environments declare one thing and enact its very opposite. Um, the the sort of free thought as a collective has kind of sought to think alternatively to this hegemonic um, understanding of inhabitation. Um, to ask what if new knowledges and new insights were not owned by, let's say, research, research intensive environments uh, in which they're located? What if research was not so individualized so as to become a credit within forms of kind of disciplining governance and economies of financialization? What if friendship and curiosity and concern were the frameworks in which research is carried out? What if research is not heroically storming the frontiers of knowledge, um, pulling rabbits out of hats, astonishing the world with solutions to problems? What if research was a form of habitation, of inhabiting an environment differently, akin to what Moten and Harney have called fugitive study? So this kind of undeclared presence, unnamed but powerfully active, is what we're calling, Lewis and I, are calling residues and sediments, like layers of lime scale. It coats the surfaces, but does not breach the contours, making things sluggish, not fully responsive, responsive to the calls of efficiency, corporate mobilization, marketization, that so dominate our environments at this moment. Spectrality, I think, is that which can ward off capture. And I think this leads us directly to what was the, the sort of, of end of the discussion between Maria and uh, Nora and Adrian in the last session. 
Uh, maybe, maybe uh, Adrienne, if I could have uh, maybe slide number four. I just want to go into one kind of, of instance. And um, that instance has to do with where my kind of, of, of query about spectral infrastructure began. And um, the, the, and that is that I've been for the past uh, 22 years, uh, a member of faculty at Goldsmiths in London, uh, which is on the one hand, a kind of shambolic and badly mismanaged institution in which uh, not much works. And on the other hand, an institution that is constantly being frog marched into the, the kind of frontiers of neoliberal managerial understandings of education as a kind of marketized project that um, can answer, um, can, can take part and answer a variety of economies. And um, one of the things that interested me in this situation, which is kind of suspended between mismanagement and, and kind of dysfunction on the one hand, and these constant exhortations to, um, to be profitable, to, to satisfy market needs, to, to um, be legible and translatable. Um, one of the things that really interested me was the fact that within, it's kind of suspended between these two sets of imperatives or these two conditions, um, there was a certain kind of sedimentation of um, quite radical critical thinking that simply would not go away. And, um, and I started trying to think about how it is that in an institution that doesn't want to embrace this kind of thinking in any way, what, what is its kind of capacity for persistence? And where exactly does it accrue? So I'm just, I'm, I'm bringing you uh, one very short instance, which is the fact that there are two figures, Stuart Hall, and Richard Hoggart, founding figures of the British left. Richard Hoggart wrote the uses of literacy in the 1950s, and Stuart Hall was um, probably the most prominent thinker to bring together questions of race and questions of governance um, within the, the kind of, of, of uh, British political map. And both of them had um, certain kinds of presences within this institution. Um, after Stuart Hall died, we, um, uh, we had a, a whole series of projects. And what you're seeing here is um, a building that is named the Professor Stuart Hall Building in which one of my colleagues, Susan Shukley and her students did a huge project called Learning with Stuart Hall, in which um, the, the sort of, of questions of experience uh, were related to questions of study. And Adrienne, could you just pull us through the next images? Um, and this is the, the learning from Stuart Hall, and this is a, a, a portrait of Stuart Hall, a double portrait of so Stuart Hall that um, was actually imposed on the, the um, front of, of the building that was dedicated to him after his death. And um, the, the sort of, of the, the fact that this could live together with these constant exhortations towards um, marketizing knowledge um, rather than remaining with its kind of, of sedimental experience. And the next one. And the, the fact that um, we have a, a kind of composite, a composite image of Stuart Hall in a 
uh, early, um, in an early demonstration um, of the left in which he began to introduce questions of colonialism and race into the kind of, of political discourse of the left, um, superimposed with images of the, the um, anti-racist occupation of Goldsmith's town hall, of Goldsmith's main administration building, which is called the Deptford Town Hall. And the, the fact that none of these have any room whatsoever uh, within the, the kind of actual narrative of the institution. So they're there and not there. They're, they're there, but not in any way harnessed to a kind of informing narrative. And um, Adrian, could I have the, the ghostly infrastructure slide just to, to um, thank you. Um, so the, the and this is this is something that we've been been kind of, of of thinking about. So, what are the ghostly infrastructures of radicality that somehow reside within an institutional structure without being evident, without being being acknowledged? And so, we're thinking in terms of the excitements, the potentialities, the gestures of comfort the constant banter, the chains of gossip, and the refrains of song in the air, a buzz made by an enthralled audience, a hush when someone has said something important without staging its importance, are some of the building blocks of a ghostly infrastructure, the residues of radicality, of rage, of struggle, that occasionally of an overwhelming realization of emancipation, like water seepage, these works their way through the buildings and the structural fabrics. At once material and immaterial, they leach onto the fabric of the structure and haunt it, refusing it a monolithic authority. Um, so I, I want to, to kind of, of, to go back to Lewis and to, uh, thank you, Adrienne. Uh, I want to go back to, to Lewis and um, ask him about the, the sort of an equal contradiction, it seems to me, within the sphere that you're thinking about, which is that all urban planning is grounded within large scale policy and planning um, that is so materially grounded and so much um, kind of, of anticipating future needs, you know, future markets, future kind of, of, of growth and expansion. And at the same time does precisely what I think is happens institutionally, which is certain kinds of sediments somehow refuse um, to, 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 to depart from the, the, the sort of environment and continue to operate as a kind of, of counter narrative. Yeah, well, um, Alberto in the, in the chat mentioned um, a new scheme, which is um, a direct outgrowth of the example that I showed in that image of King's Cross, because it's the, the same real estate developer called Argent. And um, Argent were originally, um, I think, I think they were linked to the, the, the post office kind of pension fund. And they were that bit of the, the institution that was involved in real estate development. And so the, the scheme that we see in King's Cross is presented as a kind of pioneering template, which is real estate at its most progressive, right? At the level of real estate, right? In, in the kind of the consciousness, the ideology, right? Of um, real estate, King's Cross, because it's able to do this um, mixing of, of uses, right? Of, of not just commercial and, uh, and social, not just eating and drinking and working in offices, because it, 
it's interested in art and culture, right? It's seen as this template which can then circulate around the world and is influential. Now, that template is spreading to, um, to another part of London, to Tottenham. So I'm just going to share my screen because I think this then um, may throw into relief this kind of question of um, that which resists in, in, a, in a pretty stark way. So hang on. It's always a bit of a scary moment when you do this kind of sharing a screen because you don't want people to see what's on your desktop. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so this is, um, as I said, this, so this is the, the image, the speculative image, and this is its realization, right? And what you can see is it's, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, um, a great verisimilitude, right, between the, the anticipated idea of the near future and its crystallization in reality. So there's, there's a great deal of confidence in the way in which um, this particular enlightened, you know, in scare quotes, form of real estate is able to kind of impose its kind of vision, its kind of real estate utopian vision onto the city. Now, as Alberto said, this is spreading in London and the newest version of this is actually a mutation of this form of capital because this pension fund this institutional company that's involved in real estate development called Argent has recombined with, I think, an American um, real estate company in a new partnership. Uh, and they're involved in uh, the urban regeneration of North London, Tottenham Hale, right? Now, the, the reason why I raised this example is because when we look at these schemes, and if we've got time later on, I'll, I'll come back to then what I think is the analytical um, dimension of this, um, of this notion of spectral infrastructure. Because I, th I think what the analysis of spectral infrastructure is meant to do is um, not only allow us to confront, say, for example, gentrification, what it, what it maybe allows us to do is to think of um, Spectres, I wouldn't say it haunts these schemes because the spectrality we're talking about here is alive, right? And it's, it's real, right? Because what this scheme in Tottenham Hale is meant to be a solution to is a solution to the, uh, the riots of 2011, right? Which are precipitated uh, by the police shooting and killing um, of Mark Duggan, right? So these images, um, the infrastructure here is meant to compress, right? Um, 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 the black um, British kind of youth of London, right? So this is in a way a kind of an extra legal mode of policing, which is happening uh, at the level of um, what's called urban regeneration, right? So, when we look at these kind of schemes, as well as then looking at how um, art, culture, the sociality of everyday life is kind of curated and cultivated and is kind of um, neutralized, right, in this kind of depiction of um, um, urban settlement right, and, and also urban contentment, right? What this compression is also trying to do is um, um, squeeze life out of the city and also squeeze life out of um, the racialized um, kind of subjects of that city. Right? So I, th I think what we're trying to explore here um, in spectral infrastructure, just to give you another example, right, um, is the way in which um, the environmentalization of social life um, and the environmentality that comes with real estate development is, is meant to kind of separate um, us um, from uh, an experience of antagonism, as Stefano was talking about earlier, which is, which is not dead and hasn't gone away, um, but exists at the level of a kind of a silence that these systems of accumulation want to command. They want to command silence. 
Now, silence and the relationship to urban sound is, uh, I would suggest, one way of um, trying to engage a different kind of mode of perception in order to um, um, understand um, these spectral infrastructures that real estate wants to um, command uh, and control and deny access to. Uh, this is an image of, um, uh, it was probably taken um, in the, the late 19th century, of Lascars in London. And Lascars were uh, East Asian, or sorry, they were um, merchant seamen who were recruited by the East Indian Company from the Indian South Continent and also Southeast Asia and East Asia to work um, on the ships. And then the East Indian Company would then deposit them in London and effectively kind of abandon them. And then the presence of the Lascars in the late 19th century and early 20th century London in particular, they were seen as a residue um, of the colonial process. Right? And their image um, and uh, their destitution, their poverty, was then was, was sort of used then as, as a way of uh, demarcating the difference between um, the metropolis uh, and the colony, between the metropolis and the plantations. Um, and what we see today, again, in a different part of London, is um, the way in which you know, history and the, is stripped and reconstituted through these kind of environmental systems. So this is um, uh, an advertisement for, for, for a duplex flat that at the time it'd been sold to a place called Lasco Wharf. Right? So I think with spectral kind of infrastructure, um, what, we're, what we're trying to do here is uh, develop a form of analysis or, or a way of sensing right? um, how um, the environment is being kind of spatialized uh, in order to um, command time and command temporality. But there is always a kind of a residue which, which resists. Um, and, and there is something then which um, always kind of destabilizes this notion of um, a kind of a pleasant urban society, which is meant to be uh, the kind of the rule, uh, the term of order uh, for the, the, the future of of London. I, I think that one of one of the things that are crucial to examine are the the is the tension between the setup of progressive urban environments, progressive institutions, in which there is a promise. There's a promise of a kind of open gathering. There's, there's a promise of assembly. There's a prom promise of sort of, of, of greater uh, equality, right? Of an environment that produces greater equality, while at the same time devoiding it of criticality. Right, so it's the, the, one of the reasons that I'm interested in, in habitation, uh, in the way in which these seemingly progressive environments are inhabited is because of this tension between a promise of progress and a, a kind of uh, voiding of criticality. So Lewis and I have been reading a text by Horton Spillers um, that is, kind of, of, of trying to, to kind of ask where the, the kind of critical in the operations of critical theory um, is actually being enacted. And I would say that this is the question for um, a, a kind of understanding of the way in which environments are inhabited by the residues of radicality, whose, whose one great potential is to reintroduce criticality into that space that seemingly uh, offers kind of, of progressiveness. And the, the spatial and the affective dimensions of this um, are really, really uh, important because the excavation, I think, cannot be a material excavation, 
the excavation has to be, um, and if I can be anecdotal for a minute, a, a few years ago when uh, Stuart Hall died, we organized at Goldsmiths a huge kind of, of event um, in to, to try and, and, and really get a sense of the enormity of the legacy that he held for us, not institutionally, but across the country uh, in terms of our intellectual and political histories. And I ran a panel on Stuart Hall and the arts. And um, when I left it, I was walking up the stairs to my office and um, this very young woman an undergraduate student stopped me and she said, you, you were on that panel. I said, yeah. And she, and she looked at me and she said, this Stuart Hall, he's really cool. And I said, what, what makes you think that he's really cool? And she stopped dead in the middle of the stairs, people rushing up and down, thought about it quite seriously. And then she said, because everything matters. And I thought, you know, this is what, this is the, the kind of perception that does not come from a material excavation, that does not come from a kind of historical narrative. This is precisely the residues of radicality that are elided by the promises of progress. Yeah, it, um, the, the promise of progress reminds me of, um, um, there's a moment in uh, Spiller's, his, you know, obviously very famous essay, Mama's Baby, um, where she's talking about um, um, real estate um, in the form that it takes um, in the antebellum United States through slavery, right? And that real estate, um, because it doesn't make this distinction between um, the land and, and the enslaved human being, uh, Spiller says it enables then this, this, this kind of delirious mode of access. Um, and in Spiller's more recent work, which I think, um, Maybe what would be very interesting then to think about, you know, where criticality needs to be kind of, kind of pushed, um, is the extremely disturbing point that Spillers makes about the way in which, um, in relation to say the, the architecture of Monticello, the architecture of Thomas Jefferson's um, uh, building, that architecture is all designed around um, a stratification of the household, obviously around the paternal organization of the domestic sphere, right, of the family. But Spillers also says there's a shadow family, right? um, and, there's, and then there's the rape and abuse of, of uh, the slave that Thomas Jefferson loves, right? And Spillers says, you know, well, what is love in a situation? where this is made possible and where this is then reproduced through reconstruction, right? uh, through real estate and as you know, Du Bois then says, uh, through finance capitalism after reconstruction, right? So in a way, I think then the, the, the criticality uh, uh, here is about um, looking um, and trying to um, understand this, this enforcement of, of kind of silence, uh, but then also trying to understand it's not just about being able to say, well, this happened, right? Because people know that this happened, but obviously that knowledge of history in itself is not enough to confront the problem. I, I, think, I think there's there's also the absolute necessity of, um, and this, this has to do with the kind of, of, of with infrastructural protocols, which is to in some way kind of, of completely, um, I think not, not, not kind of reinvent, but hijack the language uh, in which the, the sort of, of this is being demonstrated. So the, for example, I, 
when when one encounters like urban density um, uh, studies, of which there are many uh, in in people who study who study urban space, the density is always perceived of as proximity and intensity of activity. That's density, right? But I, I'm always sort of thinking so. What, why do we not have the density of rage, right? Why do we not have the, 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 the density of urban rage as part of the vocabulary of what an urban density is? So the, the sort of, of the absolute need to hijack the protocols by which the, the, the kind of the very enactment and understanding of infrastructure takes place and to, to recognize the effective dimensions seems, seems absolutely important. And I, I think it's, it's kind of interesting to, to think in terms of specific environments because it gives us the opportunity of introducing kind of affective dimensions into environments that are kind of, of organized and marked and graded according to completely different, much more material, much more statistical kind of, of, of um, vectors. Do we need do we need to finish, Maria, and go into conversation now? Yeah, I wanted to just uh, join you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, both Irit and Luis. This this is fascinating. I think we need a couple of more days to uh, untangle so many things you you brought up, and the chat is very very active. You unleashed quite something. Um, uh, while we bring other members of Free Thought to join us. I want to encourage everybody to post questions uh, on the chat or raise your hands. Uh, but before uh, uh, we turn to these questions, I wanted to carry carry on with this notion of rage, Irit, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and bring us back to the to the very beginning of this um, uh, conversation. And I wonder whether it would be safe to assume um, that the that the driving force or maybe an entry point to this conversation about on or and research on uh, spectral infrastructure is actually uh, a, a, some sense of disenchantment or disenfranchisement with the educational institutions um, or educational institutions in general. Is this notion of disenchantment a kind of driving force behind this. I um, sorry, I just need more light here. Um, I I don't I don't share a sense of disenchantment because it's so clear to me that these spaces are inhabited by absolutely contradictory forces that um, together make up the environment. So it's it's a question of you know which bit of it your ear is attuned to, and um, so my my ear is often attuned to the enraged, mm -hmm. but it's also about the way you know in, in a in a maybe simpler way, one of the things that Lewis and I have been talking about is, you know the the sort of where where do you locate the source of knowledge. So for example, Armatya Sen, who's written so eloquently, you know, about poverty, he says, poverty knows, <clears throat> right? Poverty is not that which needs to be eradicated and fixed. Poverty knows. So what we need to is learn what poverty knows. I, I would say that in the university, rage knows, right? And what we have to do yeah. is not accommodate its claims, but really develop the possibility of understanding what it knows. I think this is what Stuart Hall calls experience in learning, right? Mm -hmm. Experience in study. That that is sort of, of of where we are located. Nora, did you want to 
weigh in. Did I hear, did I see notes? I, I thought I heard somebody. So if anybody wants to step in now. Um, uh, one other clarification question that I have, um, uh, Irit, um, you started from, um, we are infrastructural beings, not ideological beings. Do we then assume that the infrastructure is neutral, uh, ideologically neutral? No, no, um, the, the exact opposite. I think we've spent a lot of time sort of, of, of I think, ex exploring how um, infrastructure is hugely coded, though it, I think, denies its own coding. But the, the I, I, I think this comes in, in a way, it was really Lewis's phrase, infrastructural beings. It comes from um, sort of a earlier phase of this project um, where we were kind of trying to clarify for ourselves the degree to which infrastructure determines, you know, this determines disciplines, uh, produces value, so that we are um, kind of, of much more um, infrastructural beings than we are ideological beings, right? It's, it's kind of the navigation of our lives um, takes place and choices get made through infrastructural choices uh, and not always through ideological choices. And the, the and so this this is kind of of Lewis. Do you want to to say a bit more about infrastructural beings since it was you? Who... Uh, yeah, I can't remember saying it, but I'll take the credit. Okay. <laughs> um, but well, it makes me think of again this this point that um, Denise made, and I just saw in the chat somebody was asking a, a question about methods. And um, it made me think of this um, very important kind of, um, and possibly the most kind of radically orthodox way of reading Marx's dialectic of infrastructure and superstructure I've ever come across. There's, usually when you're, um, you know, you're first dipping your toe into the kind of, um, the kind of thinking of historical materialism, what usually happens is you come across this very useful kind of model of infrastructure and superstructure, based superstructure. And then somebody will come along and tap you on the shoulder and go, well, don't take that seriously. Uh, because obviously, you know, this, this question of the economy dominating, you know, what you think, how you relate, how the world is kind of codified at the level of law, language, even music, right? It, it can't be everything, right? But if you look at the most kind of interesting thinkers who thought with Marx on this problem, right, they always say this, or they usually raise this kind of point, right? And I'm thinking here of Stuart Hall in particular, because Stuart Hall in the 19, early 1970s spent a massive amount of time working through um, Marx's unpublished introduction to the first volume of Capital, right? And, um, and, and at the end of that unpublished introduction to Capital, which is eventually published as the introduction to the Grundrisse, Marx makes a note, right? And one of the notes is um, this dialectical relationship, which I'm posing, right, between forces of production and relations of production, you know, between the infrastructure and superstructure, he, sa he says, and we should not forget it, he says, is, is a relationship whose boundaries are still to be determined, right? in the sense that it's something that's uh, unfolding at the level of history and politics, right? But it's also an open problem at the level of conceptualization. So it's that point where theory and practice kind of collide, right? And this, this point is important to Stuart Hall, it's important to Raymond Williams, um, it's something that recently Ruth Gilmore has kind of turned on its head by thinking about infrastructures of feeling, right, in relation to understand the antagonisms which are built into the systems which are meant to divide and separate. Right? So I think um, in relation to this question of infrastructural beings, then um, instead of thinking about this in ontological terms as, as being, as a question of being, it would be about maybe something to do with a kind of 
aesthetic dimensions of sensuousness, where we, where we are able to learn from others, right? And receive from others uh, a way of feeling, you know, which you might associate with being, right? But might not be reduced to it necessarily, right? That gives us access to that thing that um, Adrian and Stefano were talking about when they were thinking about the thing that we cannot give up, right? Or the thing that, that, that it cannot be seeded, given that capitalism wants to command an absolute rent on everything and everyone on the planet, right? So I think this question then of um, kind of methods and forms of analysis, it, it's not about engaging in an analysis, say, of urban planning in order to critique, say, the human capital of the conventional kind of real estate industry. It would be more about a kind of a modality which, which um, receives from, say, black music, um, an understanding of rhythms uh, and, and also disruptions to rhythms, uh, which, which gives us, um, um, we, we can't call it access, but it, it does indicate something that Cedric Robinson called uh, an ontological totality that is both underneath and in excess of capital. Thanks, Sorry. Louis. Thanks. Can Austin. I ask, uh, where is Stefano? The, I, I see him in the, in the, uh, the thing, but I, I, can we invite him to join us? Stefano, we need you. Are you here? He's in the room, um, but unless he turns on his uh, camera, I can't add him to the to the group, so to speak. Okay. okay so let's hope Stefano uh, will join us. Uh, there are a number of questions in the in the chat I want to go to, and in the methods. Thanks, uh, Luis, uh, for bringing this uh, up to the to the fore. I have a question about the politics of spectral infrastructure. And uh, it's related to what uh, you, Irit, uh, just mentioned and what I recall through our conversations about infrastructure that, that we quickly forget the degree to which these have become protocols that bind and confines, uh, confine us uh, and their demand to either resist them or to, to preserve them. So what is then the politics of spectral infrastructures? In other words, what, can, what do they generate? What do they enable? I think we probably all of us have different answers to that or, or slightly different answers, but I would say that um, something that was was sort of said in the first session today that the the sort of, of the ability to ward off capture, the ability to ward off inscription into immediately into kind of resistance, um, and repudiation is, I think, the work of that that spectral infrastructure demands of us. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the the um, what what spectral infrastructure generates in terms of your question is the ability to exist critically in a modality that isn't defined by the very thing that one is is resisting, which seems um, really, really important, this this kind of notion of warding off capture. I, for me, that's the most important part, I think, of, of, of spectral infrastructure. So I know others will um, have kind of, of um, different approaches to it, but I think I think there's there's also um, there is there is a sort of, of assumption. There's there are a lot of assumptions around knowledge, and there are a lot of assumptions around the frontality of knowledge. And I think one of my main interests has always been kind of undoing the frontality of knowledge, of not assuming that I know what the subject is, that I can marshal all its forces, that I know how to produce answers. I, 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 I was sort of, of, of thinking about what does knowledge do? Not what it is, but what does it do? And thinking knowledge thrums. 
and thrumming is the, the vibration that um, is communicated to us, let's say within the hull of a big ship through the noise of the engines. It's not direct noise, it's not direct address. It's a kind of environmental vibration which envelops us, but does not address us directly. And I, I think of the operations of knowledge kind of perceived through spectral infrastructures as being able to commune with thrumming. And that is in, in many ways, maybe the, the kind of, of most kind of apt response to the frontality of knowledge that I can think of. So I, others will have very different perspectives. So. Mao. Well, maybe there's also a reference to your uh, remark on uh, attunement. Yeah, uh, well, I'm thinking uh, about also Stefano's uh, description of this uh, space. Uh, for me, the spectral infrastructure in the conversation we had is a space that it's a, it's a, it's a space of capture. It's a space of being captured. And uh, as um, uh, also Denise was saying, is a space that's turned out uh, into a space of potential liberation or reclaiming and reparation. So what I, what I, what I like about uh, precisely this new uh, conversation about the spectre, that the spectre is not the invisible anymore, is a, is a space that is there uh, to be uh, reclaimed uh, in, in the open. Uh, and there can be, we have discussed also in the past, in past conversation, the relationship between narrative of captivity and the power the narrative of captivity have uh, on the captors. So I think that we are working a little bit around this, uh, around the possibility of thinking about the uh, uh, infrastructure as a space of reclaiming or reparation or remediation. Um, and yes, uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what, uh, um, Louis was saying the, 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 the kind of dialectic vision of uh, politics is, uh, is, is really an approximation in a way that Marx himself was thinking about this space between infrastructure and superstructure is very porous and uh, interpenetrated and entangled themselves. Um, and that uh, the more the spectra becomes a material component of this struggle, the more dialectic has to uh, give ground to a stepping back, or I, I really like the notion of ontology of seeing this idea of connecting to these uh, absences with us, uh, but it's also quite uh, uh, tangible. So, um, yeah, uh, I don't know if that kind of answers to the question. Great, Mao. Thank you. Let me let me go to chat. There are a few questions that I would like to bring up. This one is addressed uh, mainly to Irit and Luis, but maybe also Adrian and Nora would want to wait in a way on this. It's from uh, Mia Lermheis. Thank you. It's uh, exciting and simultaneously depressing to note in your wonderful contributions, Irit and Luis, the longevity of ghost stories for adults, as uh, Amy Barber called the changes that images underwent when traveling. Indeed, the residue that resists and destabilizes, often void in criticality. Could you possibly speak some uh, more to the role of art image in, images in the spectral infrastructure? I, I, I don't think art images, and I think art processes, I think the, the sort of, that artistic practices, practice-based research within the sphere of, of you know, contemporary culture, mm -hmm. that what they really produce for us, it's not images, it's not, it's not something that you know, delivers us an alternative vocabulary, it's processes that allow us to access um, the, the, the kind of modalities that we're unable to access um, through, through you know, what I call a frontality of representation, of knowledge, uh, of address. And so the, the um, sorry, Lewis has just, just written that there's, um, I think his internet is down. Um, 
the the sort of, of, of I I I don't want to make demands for art to produce anything for us. I think it it kind of of, of it works with us in order to kind of, of make make visible or or um, make tangible kind of levels of desire, um, ways of, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, what, what sort of, of, of contemporary practices have allowed me. And that is largely to position myself very differently vis-a-vis -vis some kind of, you know, world historical, you know, world political importance that I absolutely cannot face frontally. I can't, I, I can't have a position towards it. I can't have a say about it. And I find in the kind of processes that a lot of contemporary artistic or, or cultural um, practices develop a, a kind of another entry point, a series of oblique entry points into the problematics that we're surrounded by. So I, I don't have a demand for art to make images for us. Um, I think it produces entry points and ways of knowing and modes of address that um, allow you a, a semblance of an entrance into something. Whereas if you look at the historical facades, the political facades, the ideological facades, you have no entry point into those. Nora, I suspect you have things, or Adrian, I suspect you have things to say about that. Adrian, go first if you want. Yeah. <clears throat> so I guess also for me, the interest is not so much in, um, in images um, uh, as representational economies, but in uh, images as carriages of the invisible or as images of um, scenes of gathering that images do not see. So the turning of the image, as it were, into its own uh, um, deconstitution, the way uh, that images provoke semblances rather than resemblances, as, as it was uh, noting. So, um, I mean, for me, the, the question of what does the spectral infrastructure give us, what does it do politically, I think is, is, is um, enmeshed with that. Uh, it's also, I'm, I'm very, very struck across all of this conversation, um, particularly um, Lewis and Irit's conversation just now, with uh, the recurrence of the word uh, communing and what the commune might be as a, a kind of um, a spatial um, proposition. And I was thinking a lot of that uh, very beautiful book that uh, was um, published of uh, Roland Barthes that is called How to Live Together. It's actually not a written book of Barthes. I think it's probably one of the last, one of his last lecture series before his death and it's a sort of assembly of his lectures. And um, I was thinking a lot in, in Irritan um, Lewis's talk about this, the, uh, the proposition that Bart uh, makes in that book really, which is that um, uh, this, uh, it's, a, it's actually um, a protocol really uh, to do with what he calls the, the practice of idiorhythmy. So the relationship um, as it were between um, you know, he's, he's talking a lot about uh, ascetic practices and hermetic practices, uh, religious practices. And so he's, he's thinking about how to live together as a kind of question of the relationship between solitude and gathering, basically, and the rhythmics uh, of the relation between the two. How is it that we convene um, um, uh, a, a rhythmics of relation between the two that is livable? And that to me would seem to also to be at the heart of the question that Irit is talking about in terms of um, habitation as a kind of uh, practice of uh, a fugitive study. Um, uh, so live, live, living as a radical, uh, a, a continuous 
uh, learning uh, practice. Um, yeah, that's that's for me what uh, the the spectral infrastructure might give us. I don't know if Lewis has thoughts on uh, act, the spatialization of communes and the spatialization of um, educational architectures and the the way in which if there are if he has um, radical um, uh, examples of um, uh, of urban architectures in which these forms of uh, uh, the relationship between communing and solitude can be differently convened. But uh, I mean, uh, that that would be, a, a, for me, an interesting line of thinking to, to pursue for us as well. I know we are always also, as a collective, trying to think about how we can cohabit a little more. Yeah, we have Luis uh, back. Oh, good. Luis, just in time for a question I wanted to read out for you. I actually would have had it. Okay, but it's So fine. go on, go on, Nora, please. I, yeah. I didn't notice. Sorry, apologies. Yeah. My bad. Um, no, no, I just thought it's so... I'm here in Hamburg now. So, of course, calling Abi Warburg. Um, you know, I, it's so interesting that in these people like Warburg and Benjamin and Karl Einstein how they relate to this material, how they start to collect, how they bring, how they get in touch with these things. Like Freud, Freud also, he says, you know, a lot of these theories, they get, they, he, he learned a depth about the unconscious in relation to the depth of the things he relates to that are around him. And of course, also the books, it's images, books, things, gathered gathered and re and brought in a completely different order in a time where or where the world is where knowledge is ordered in order to make race differences in order to in order to organize itself around a certain like a huge movement of youth that is on the one hand progressive but on the other hand ordering knowledge um, in order to make it clean and in this whole endeavor of cleaning knowledge, there is this desire to relate differently and is actually really this affinity to the things and, and to the collection that would, that would really also, I would really say, relate to the conflict that are not so easily, you cannot so easily clean them up even though you create a whole bunch of academia just for that, you know? Um, that builds the superstructure for the colonial and uh, fascist killings. Thanks so much, Nora, for this uh, really important addition. I also am really uh, moved uh, uh, by the generosity on the chat uh, part of this session by how everybody's sharing resources. And I really look forward to read more about thrumming um, uh, from Jen uh, Bennett's uh, Vibrant Matter books, a book. So thank you for that reference. I must personally ad admit, and specifically in relationship to the project that you as a free thought have done on shipping and being shipped, that for me, thrumming has those connotations that I think uh, would be really um, important to untangle. And I'm sure uh, uh, you are doing so uh, already, but I wanted to go we're out of time, people. How are we going to do this? A um, few more minutes. Um, I have here from uh, Julia uh, Morandera, the author's claim for a radical form of listening to sense out is to also draw in for the senses recuperate frequencies fluttering dynamically to touch abundance. Would you see this listening as a methodology to sense spectral infrastructure without capturing? What would a sonic spectral infrastructure be, Luis? Um, well, I, I, I think I, I can relate to this. Uh, I think this is a very important point. And, and one of the methodology I think that we are working through is this idea of uh, uh, resonance or this idea of uh, refraction or remediation, this uh, kind of multimodal uh, uh, um, approach. The images are not just uh, 
uh, images that can be captured in one just one medium. So this idea of, of, of this kind of uh, uh, vibration uh, that operates at different sensory levels. Um, and, and also, you know, thinking about uh, what Denise was saying, this kind of the raw materialism, this idea of bringing inside matter into the understanding of capital and labor, the way capital and labor in the end are this kind of accumulation of matter, this uh, refraction and refra uh, uh, re re recasting it across different mediums. And so, yeah, the specter is also this space that can be reopened once again, and the, the space is of relationality, also in terms of we imagine as medium. Uh, that's why I think we keep on resonating with similar uh, spaces, you know, Louise, uh, uh, think about resonance and, and I'm interested, for instance, in the idea of optical refraction. But I think that this kind of uh, radical materialistic perspective is very interesting, is very important for at least, yeah, I think for our methodology. Wonderful. Thanks, Massimiliano. I, I lost uh, Luis from view, but I see him posting. And I also realize, uh, uh, Julia, I read only one part of, uh, of your question, but uh, fortunately, everybody's reading uh, the chat. So thank you for pointing that out. Louis, would you want to um, weigh in? You posted um, a reference to the back, best uh, uh, book, best work of music criticism I've seen on yeah. Sonic Spectra Infrastructure. Wonderful. Thank you for the resource. Would you want to? It's just to answer Julia, uh, Julia's question about um, sonic spectral infrastructure. I think uh, just to give a shout out to Danvia Bra because his new book is uh, is extraordinary on this actually. Um, so take a look at it. Um, Fantastic. I am going to propose we are going to leave it here. I uh, um, I know we could go for many more days like this and uh, um, we will, to which I really uh, uh, look forward. Um, I just want to thank uh, all of you for a remarkable day, um, extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you everybody um, who joined us. Um, thank you uh, both teams at the Vera Lee Center and uh, Buck, and uh, of course, free thoughts. And with this, I uh, offer the word to Karin. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Maria, and all the speakers. It's completely presumptuous to try to um, summarize this extraordinary discussion that was unfolding um, on the screens for several hours. And I am just very, very grateful. There are many, many um, ideas to return to. Um, but most present right now at this uh, moment is Iri Drogov's demand of um, in spectral infrastructure that it demands of us the ability to ward off capture. And I think that has such incredible um, potential of looking beyond our current situation. It's very, very inspiring. Um, everyone else said absolutely wonderful things as well. So we are very much looking forward to returning to the video documentation. And um, I urge you to do the same. I want to thank Bach and Maria and Rachel in particular for a fantastic collaboration at the Verily Center. And this whole project was spearheaded by Ariola Pira. I want to thank her very much. And she was, um, as always, capably and expertly supported by Adrian Ume, the Assistant Director of Operations, as well as by Wen Zhuan, the Assistant Director of Editorial Initiatives. Um, thank you to our sponsors and thank you, um, you incredibly generous and inspiring and um, uh, wonderful audience that keeps us thinking and working and we look forward to welcoming you back at us at the Verily Center on September 13th um, when we are having a discussion around protocols of surveillance on occasion of Sam Durant's uh, big installation at the High Line on the spur of a work that is untitled, in bracket, however, it's called The Drone. This is a collaboration with the High Line, and um, it will take um, off on September 13th and will be the first event for us in the fall semester. 
Until then, uh, be well. And again, thank you very, very much.